Hey guys, Dave and Jamie here. Um, you all asked how we became bird trainers, so we thought we'd film a video together and talk about it. And since Dave became a bird trainer before I did, I'm gonna let him start with his story. Yeah, so it's actually kind of ironic because we're filming this in a dressing room at the Greg Fruin Theater. <laughs> and so my story actually starts um, seeing a magician by the name of Greg Fruin on TV in 1994. I was 10 or 11 years old and I saw him perform a dove act. and. At the time, I didn't know, but he had won every major award in the world of magic with this particular act. And I had a pet turtle at the time, and I said to my mom, hey, can I, can I get some doves? And she said, well, if you find a good home for the turtle, then you can get two doves. And so I found a college student who wanted to have a pet, but couldn't have a pet at college, so she really wanted this turtle. And, uh, and so I gave her the turtle, and I got some doves. So then I started working with um, with the doves and putting together an act. And by the age of 15, I had a dove act where I was performing all over with magic. And um, by 17, I was winning gold medals with that particular act and I wanted to add a parrot to it. Um, my parents always had birds. They had a blue and gold macaw named Tico that you may have seen if you've seen Taming Training Tricks 1, 2, and 3, and 5, and 6, and 7, and whatever. There's a lot of Taming Training Tricks. Uh, and he was on most of those. And uh, that bird's now with my mom still. Um, and then they also had a Moluccan cockatoo, which they, like most people, didn't know what they were getting into. The bird started to pluck, it started to be aggressive. It was things that we had no idea we were doing wrong. And my family rehomed that bird. And so my brother and I basically said, hey, let's, let's start a, a bird training business. And we had no idea what we were doing. And, um, and I wanted to put this blue and gold macaw into my bird act, into my dove act and make it appear at the end. Well, if those of you that have followed our career know that I now have um, Tusa is currently at the end of the Dove Act, but that's kind of where it started. And so we we went to the breeder that uh, sold us the Moluccan cockatoo and she had this book, I don't remember who it was by, but it was super scientific and it was really difficult to understand. And so we kind of fumbled our way through it and taught the bird a trick and um, noticed that that made the bird be a lot nicer and more social and look forward to to being with us. So we kind of stumbled upon this huge thing. We thought, you know what, I bet we could make this and sell it to PetSmart. Um, but PetSmart never bought it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we produced some DVDs and, um, and continued to basically look at what science had shown for animal training, but really decoded it in a way that was usable to, to other people. And so that's kind of been... It's continued to be our theme ever since we started, and that's just like, you know, even with the Family Friendly Parrot, our, our currently our newest course at the time of filming this, and it was, it was like, okay, now people really want the science, but let's simplify it into these specific ways of using it, and that's, that's kind of how it all evolved, and so I started competing more with the birds and the magic, and, and then it all, it all just kind of flowed together and kept evolving. Yeah, and it's always kind of gone together, your magic yeah. and the bird training. He's always been able to just kind of like make it all flow and that's what everything's based off of is everything we've done with magic. It's, that's where it started, yeah. yeah. And it's been really cool because, you know, with there's been a lot of high profile shows that we've had that have come from having the parrot training background with the magic and having those go together from doing our just a bird show at a theme park to we trained birds for David Copperfield for his islands. We trained birds for two-year tour on Ringling Brothers. Um, we've we've trained them for so many different things, and it's these opportunities in Saipan as well. They came up because we have the trained birds in the show. So it's kind of been our own niche, and all this it just built on itself. Yeah, and then I guess how I kind of got into it was... Uh, <laughs> it's a little different story. I decided to date Dave, so it kind of came hand in hand. Um, unlike Dave, my family did not ever have parrots. Um, I did not grow up around parrots. I... I had pretty bad childhood experiences with just wild birds chased by roosters. You know those viral videos of kids getting chased? That was pretty much me um, by a rooster, by a wild swan. Apparently my hiking trail was along its nest. <laughs> Stuff like that. So I was not a bird person. And when Dave and I got together, he obviously was. So he would just kind of... You would fill me in on everything. I didn't even know how to hold a bird. There's a really awkward photo of me early on when I think we were still dating. And I'm like holding a macaw on my arm and I'm just like, ah, super awkward. I feel like it took a much longer amount of time 
um, that I became just recently comfortable calling myself a bird trainer. Uh, and that was because I had to accumulate a lot of experience. So my initial experience was through watching Dave with birds, listening to his advice. He would tell me what certain body language meant um, in the moment. So I got to witness it firsthand and he would be kind of narrating to me in a, in a way and like translating body language for me. And then we got our very first parrot together who was Bondi, our rose breasted cockatoo or gala as they call them because they're from Australia. Uh, we got her when she was a baby. She was still hand feeding, I think. Didn't we hand yeah. feed her a little bit? Um, and I was able to learn crazy bird body language from a cockatoo because they're so much fun and they're so chaotic, especially when they're first learning to fledge and fly and everything. Uh, they're a ton of fun and there's so much going on that it was a really great bird for me to learn all of those basics and that foundation from in a non-intimidating environment. So Dave kind of knew, I feel like you had the foresight to see that um, I would learn best in the environment of a baby animal because a baby animal you don't think has the malicious intent to hurt you. Um, so nothing was intimidating. It was a very like easy environment to learn in and she is a fantastic bird and, and our like what I would relate to as our baby because she was our first bird together and we yeah. did everything with her and discovered everything with her. So throughout this entire experience of even having Bondi and then getting the jobs, you know, my <laughs> stage experience also came from Dave teaching me and then every gig that we got was a little bit different. So we worked with professional directors, choreographers, producers, uh, dancers, acrobats, everything, comedians, and I just kind of soaked everything up like a sponge because I figured if I didn't get in the box, somebody else would, and I wanted to be the one to help <laughs> with you. Um, so I made it a point to just learn everything so that I could go along with you and be part of it, and so that's what I did, and I just kind of tried to soak up absolutely everything. I've always kind of followed my gut instinct and what I'm feeling when it comes to bird training, which I think is what makes me a good trainer but also makes me a horrible teacher <laughs> um <laughs> i have a really hard time relaying what i feel or what i interpret um and i don't know where i learned that i think i just gained it just it happens experience. so fast too like those of you that know i mean it's it's hard because there's so many <clears throat> so many signals of the animal sending you and it changes so quickly you can't articulate it fast enough i was married at 17 dave was 21 he was only my uh what do you call it parental guardian or something <laughs> what were you you're my legal, legal guardian legal for, guardian for, for a like month, a month. <laughs> he ate it up I'm not allowed to do that i'm in charge uh yeah so i turned 18 a month after we got married but so when i was 19 we worked on an island called saipan which is over by guam and we worked with some macaws and that was an amazing experience. We got to do a show called Magical Flight. So a lot of it was about the birds. We were really hired for our niche with the birds. Um, and that was really amazing. I love working with macaws. Every gig that we did lended itself to different birds. We also always worked with clients on the side. And so anytime we met somebody who was just having trouble with their bird, I would usually volunteer to help them yeah. because I wanted to gain the experience. And so I would never promise any results. I would be like, I'll work with your bird for free. We'll just see what happens. <laughs> and in that show in Saipan too, we had to be, we were pushed to try different things with the birds. And so one of the challenges we had was with Bondi. We made her, I have a sketch pad, I draw a picture of a bird and I squeeze the pad and she comes climbing up. And then I would give the give her a little toss and she'd dive down and then she'd go just to the side of the spotlight. We had a little hole cut out in the venue and she'd go flying into there and basically kind of disappear. Um, and so that's really, a, that was challenging to train because she's flying into the light and so naturally she would be more blinded when she goes into a dark hole, but we had to, had to train that. Um, we had all sorts of different challenges that we had to train, you know, magically speaking too, there's the ways the birds have to appear or disappear and that had to be trained as well so it was a lot of it was a fun challenge there yeah and i think every single job that we did lended itself to something unique and completely mm -hmm. different 
And so I really gained my training experience from one of, the, one of the things I still do is I consult with other trainers in other fields. So I don't necessarily take everything from bird training, but I also am interested, who, whatever kind of trainers were around, I'll ask how they train their animals. And it just is interesting how you can take little insights and little nuggets that work in a specific field and maybe apply it and mold it and mesh it to fit your unique field. Because working with prey animals versus predator animals is completely different. Um, but it doesn't mean you might be able to like take a tactic and, and kind of mold it to work for you. And so I've always been open to that, open with consulting with other people to see how they're doing it. And just trying to take in as much information and try things. I think one of the things that you and I are both good at is we're not necessarily afraid to fail. Yeah. <laughs> um, because that just points the direction a little bit more clear. So we try things. We also, since I learned from Dave, I train very similarly as far as concepts and techniques. But when it actually comes to like, if we each had the same bird, we would train it completely differently, but probably still end up with the same result. But we have different ways of getting there. So even though I did learn from Dave, I do train my own like unique way and I enjoy training certain things that he doesn't necessarily enjoy as much and yeah. vice versa. And it, you know, interesting thing that you guys can apply too is that early on I I found that the science behind it was too confusing to to try to reference scientific materials. So ironically I went to Scientific American Mind and I had that subscription for many years and the cool thing is they used they used animals and studies with animals to then determine how humans would think. So I just looked at that and I said, okay, well, that's the human analogy. Now let's just look at how, what they did with the animal and replicate that. So I kind of worked it backwards to see, to understand from a human's perspective. Um, one of the examples that stood out to me is it's if the motivation for something is too high when the animal or the person learns it, it's almost impossible to unlearn that. So the example they said in the magazine was there was a guy who didn't know how to swim. Basically, his ship sunk, his boat sunk, and he swam like this to survive. And that was his mindset, that's how I swim. And the motivation was swim like that or you die. And so that was like the epitome of over-motivation. And so his mind, his body, everything was like, no, that is how you do it. I will not unlearn it. So he even tried to take swimming lessons later and had a hard time unlearning how to just flail in the water and actually swim. I don't know if he ever did learn it because that, that part of the story was irrelevant because when you look back at animals, if their food motivation is way too high or they're, you know, if, if they think they're going to die because they're starving, they're, you're not going to get a good behavior and you're going to have a really difficult time untraining that. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of stuff like that where it was the studies were done both on, on animals and humans, but then it would relate back to the animals. So we kind of would just reverse it now that we have the analogy for the human. Yeah, and I think we've been able to compliment each other because in our training, because there are certain things like And I, backstage, I'm like, you're so pretty, you're so nice, <laughs> you're so smart. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we've, I like to train like the little tricks. Like I like to train trick training where it's just really cute and stuff. And, and uh, Dave likes to train more show-related behaviors and flight and all, and all that sort of stuff. Oh, thanks. Did you blow that up that big? <laughs> There you go, get out. Okay, okay, we're still going, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's the last one. Yeah, for reference. Here's the last one. <laughs> Her breath is getting amazing. <gasps> so I would say that my most personal growth as a trainer came from probably One Day Miracles. Yes. Doing well, that, that was you. a challenge because we had to get it in one day. Yeah. And we were dealing with people no pressure. watch the food episode with like my bird and they're, they're probably gonna watch this and be like hey that wasn't how we were but then you rewatch it and they're like my bird's not gonna be like that <laughs> and it was like okay and we had to we had to do it in one day and it was uh yeah. it was fun and there were even times where because there are there's definitely one sad episode on there where you know oh there's great the lessons miracle, in all of it the miracle is a little bit hidden under the covers and you're kind of like oh no and those were really hard. It was hard to walk away and be like, you know what, we did everything we can and that's just where it's gonna lie. It's, I think it's like that old saying where you can bring a horse to water but you can't make it drink, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and that has been the most difficult part about 
training birds, is training people. Um, it's something that I constantly <laughs> struggle with so much that I often, like, sadly, I just won't take them on. I'll be like, yeah, you can have your consult with Dave. He is fantastic. There you go, babe. See you later. Um, yeah, it's, you know, that is the bigger challenge is that a lot of people realize when they take private courses with us that it's not, we aren't training the bird, we're training the person. And most of the time when they realize that, they're like, oh, I get it now. And then sometimes they're like, I don't want to be trained. <laughs> <laughs> and they refuse to be trained. So their bird sucks for the rest of its life. Oh, that's horrible. You know exactly what I'm thinking of. From One Day Miracles, I worked with Rasta, who is an Alexandrian parakeet, who just had severe, severe... It was aggression, but it was also fear. And I want to say it was more fear than aggression. Fagression. Fagression. <laughs> um, working with him, it took me all summer to get him to step up. To get him to just step up. Um... And I go through things where I'm enjoying the process of the training so much, but then there's another part of me who's just like, oh, come on. Like, I want it yeah. to progress. I want to see success and just like, for the love of God, please. I think one of the biggest growth spots for you personally was when we got Cressy and we decided to get into free flight training. Yeah. Because with that, one, free flight training was super frowned upon in 2007, 2008. And... And so we got we got reamed, reamed. by people that oh. didn't understand that birds are meant to fly, and um, and so that was there was the the challenge that we had from dealing with that, and now it's like it's it's widely accepted, which is amazing. But there was also more pressure to not fail, because everybody was watching us with a microscope, yeah. and that was where it was it was really interesting how that whole process evolved but you know when you free fly there's if it's a baby bird you have a little bit of room for error and and just mistakes that are natural in a process of learning but then as that bird gets older and older that window of of having error almost closes there's very little tolerance at at a given point and and so i think that was probably where where I watched you make the biggest strides because yeah. you had to. Yeah. And I mean, we, we started developing techniques for free flight that were really calculated and really thoroughly thought through. And we started to research outside um, fields, I guess. So it wasn't just parrot free flight. It was a little of everything that could possibly relate to the winds at different uh, elevations, the you know, everything about the weather and how that plays an effect on predatory type birds and mm -hmm. all of that. It was, we had to be so careful because it was so frowned upon that we were forced to learn it right the first time. Yeah. And, and we've always been the type that share our mistakes because even in bird training, you want the bird to fail because then it's going to learn how to succeed. And I feel like that's the same thing with people. So even in the free flight community, we did. Especially some people more than others. Yeah. We did uh, share some of our fails. Like one of our, uh, Cressy actually, she got chased by like 11 seagulls and it was instant. It was like, we went to the beach, we set up for this great nice day of free flight at the beach, which was our first time. We rode into the free flight community, you know, asking like, is there anything that we should be aware of? <laughs> nothing, no They're like, responses. no, nothing. <laughs> They're like, ha, 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 go out there and fail. Um, and and there were no seagulls when we started and we were flying her and we did a few flights and it was great and then all of a sudden there were 11 and they chased her and she flew safely back to Dave but man I threw that camera so hard you know I was videotaping I was like threw that sucker down and I was like wow ah, freaking out and you know I even we even published that and we're just like you know what could we have done better and we just got yelled at like that was all we just got yelled at. But it was really interesting. So, like, in that moment, uh, I can still picture Cressy flying to me in a seagull this close to her tail. And they were really big seagulls. They're huge. And I, I turned to Jamie. I said, whatever you do, don't stop filming. And we had set up... Well, she got most of it. But we had <laughs> set up everything properly. We had, based on all the, the science and the research we had done, is is we, we had done everything properly. And there was anchor birds there were you know uh i won't get into all the details of that because it's part of the flight course more or less but um i said whatever you do don't stop filming and so we watched frame by frame to see what the bird was thinking what the seagull was thinking how what why were the animals doing what they were doing and then ultimately she lost the very last maybe five seconds of footage when 
um, Cressy went to go up and over the, the, pier. the pier, and she ended up dropping under and realized that the seagulls went away, and so she landed on somebody who was trying to sunbathe. But, <laughs> um, uh, and then we, you know, and so that was a whole story, and we could look at a frame by frame to really study that, and I think that's something that, that is another tool that we use that helped us grow and become trainers, was we were willing to watch those videos from every perspective. It wasn't like, hey, look how cool I am on my social media. It was like, hey, no, what went wrong? Let's look at every little detail. How can we learn from this so that we don't ever repeat? So then it. we can look really cool on our social media. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's a challenge, right? And that's how you have to be. And it's no different, like yeah. jumping back to the magic uh, side of things. You know, one of the, the, the only tools for me to grow my magic career, because I didn't have coaches and mentors in the beginning, is I would have to watch a video, and still to this date, we watch videos we of almost that. every single show. Yeah. If we're on a cruise ship, I mean, every night after the show, we watch the video, we critique it, and we make minor changes every single time, and it's the same, it, it's absolutely the same with the parrot training as well. Yeah, after the free flight, and, and the free flight really continues for us, but it yeah. taught me to be a little bit more grounded in what I believe is right in the proper type of training, and just how I do things. Um, because that's really hard when you have people questioning you and ridicul ridiculing. Uh, you, capsizing. <laughs> don't make fun of me. Um, <laughs> when you just have people questioning your every move, it can make you question yourself. And I think that's where you really, really get into trouble. Um, I don't mind if it's Dave because I know his intentions are pure and just making me be a better trainer. But when other people don't necessarily have those intentions, uh, it can be very detrimental to you and the animals that you work with when you start taking all that in. So yeah, and then I would say some of my biggest growths have been with the birds that you guys have seen here on YouTube. You know, I didn't have as many people following me back in the storm days. His videos yeah. kind of went oh viral. Oh my gosh, just they would have done cute. so well like if they came out now. Yeah, and if they were in like really high quality, you know, because a lot of our older stuff isn't as good a quality now. Like considering now when you have this amazing quality with phones and everything. But back then I had a giant camera. We did. <laughs> yeah, there's a picture of Cressy learning to fly and Jamie's holding the camera. And Cressy, or was I holding in that? I think I might have been holding it. And Cressy's like, yeah. yeah. And Cressy hits the front of the camera, <laughs> like full impact. And the it's this big camera on my shoulder. And Yeah, and I used the same camera and it had like a suction thing to your eye. <laughs> and I was like, I was... I was pretty good with that thing, I'm just going to say. And I was following a macaw, and that macaw suddenly became really close and smashed <laughs> into the front of the camera. I had a black eye, guys. Like, for me, at least, becoming a trainer has come from the years and years of experience and just working with birds. You know, a lot of people are just like, oh, how much does it cost to send you my bird and have you train it? And you guys probably don't realize that I did, I've done these series with birds, with Rasta, with Storm, with Morgan, uh, with Chi Chi. I didn't make anything. I don't charge for that. I just saw an opportunity to help in a situation where I felt like uh, they wouldn't get the help otherwise or they wouldn't get the direction or a starting point and I just wanted to do something and had the freedom to be able to do it. I have to say too, with Morgan, you saw an opportunity to give this bird something that it wasn't going to get and it was... There's, I think there's situations where you're, you're pulled into it yeah. uncontrollably. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's I think that's what you guys see too, right? Is, is the emotion that she has in those journeys is real. And, uh, I think that's what makes it authentic. It's not all easy. And that is why I try to make sure that I show the mess ups. Um, and you know, luckily I make fewer of them now. Uh, just from all the experiences that I have had, I tend to move slower. And Dave, as a trainer, you move fast and you take you take more risks. And I think it's from his own experience of knowing when he can push. And I'm a little bit more timid of knowing for sure if I could push or not. We There's, push hard when we do in home consults. Yeah, we, that's why we call we it push. Pretty, we push to yeah. the to the limits, but we're always clear about what does that mean when we're gone, right? Like, yeah. the, so. So it's, uh, there's, it's hard to say because there's it's so many little things we can say that, that might give advice to you that may not make sense. Mm -hmm. My favorite part of bird training is the constant challenge. Yeah, the, you always liked that. The, the, um, yeah, I like to overcome the challenge. So like with free flight, everyone was like, oh, you can't do it. And so we did. Mm -hmm. And 
and that was awesome. And then there were other things that they were like, oh, you can't do that. And, and we would do it. And, you know, like we went to Kyrgyzstan to, to perform and I created my act so I can borrow doves anywhere in the world. And now that I have a macaw on the act, we've had to also have this challenge of, okay, if I can't bring my macaws, like I'm not going to ship my birds to Kyrgyzstan for four days or 10 days or whatever. So, um, so we borrowed a macaw and that was a fun challenge too. So you guys probably remember Jamie, um, working with the bird backstage and those that like getting to meet the new birds and work through stuff. Um, like here at this theater, we're able to have Greg's birds out and just, and play with them as a family. And it's, there's those challenges, but I think also in under like a, a second level of that is the people that bird training has allowed us to meet. They've been amazing. It's, it's been, we've had everything from lifelong friends come out of it to, you know, getting to meet celebrities that needed us. It wasn't like, Hey, I really want to come meet you. It was the other way around. Like Rod Stewart wanted to come backstage. Copperfield wanted to fly us out to his islands to work with him and his birds, you know, and, and there's those like the, the kind of bigger things, um, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, there's, there's all these huge opportunities that have come out of it yeah. and it's been really neat. But then also the, the really good friends, the true friends that have come out of it, um, has, has been awesome. Yeah. But what about you? I think my favorite thing is selfishly has nothing to do with people. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry. Um, I, yeah, I genuinely enjoy communicating with an animal. Like, I love when I first break down those walls and those yeah. barriers and, like, I see a tunnel of a way to communicate. Like, that's my favorite. I consider that, like, my breakthrough moment when I have that connection and we're on. And now I can, I can communicate to that animal. I just, that's my favorite part. Because once that pathway is open and we can communicate like now the possibilities are endless and we can go anywhere it's just about how much time I have with that animal final question that we wanted to answer in this series is what bird was the hardest to train you go first what you bird or what owner mm -hmm. well they specifically said what bird because they think we're training birds okay so the hardest bird had to do with the owner not not being truthful, not being upfront on what they actually wanted, and getting suckered into a situation to train under a false pretense with a very, very difficult bird and an owner that was unwilling to make the changes that had to happen. So it was a combination of the whole scenario. Sorry, that was like, sounds really heavy for you guys. Um, but it was a whole scenario that caused this bird to be so difficult to work with. Whereas I, I believe if we would have taken that bird in, it'd be a totally different story because we would put that bird through a boot camp and say, here's your new reality. And that particular bird would, would do better. I don't want to say the name of the bird, but that's kind of the scenario. And I think that's it's worth saying so that uh, sometimes if you guys are looking at different situations, it, it's more than just the bird. It's, it's you as the owner or the potential trainer to be willing to change the circumstances around it. Yeah, you have to be open and receptive because if you're not, like, it's kind of the bird gets this different, this clear communication with us and then it goes back to you and all is lost. And that can be sometimes more detrimental than, yeah, I don't know. I'll get yeah. emotional if I start. Yeah. <laughs> I'll but get fired up. What's your, what's your hardest bird? Um, well, I take on less people than Dave does. So I actually do have a hardest bird. I, I'm, I'm the person that'll look at your bird and be like, yeah, I'll work with your bird and not you. <laughs> so I'll train your bird, no problem. Um... But don't give me a human. Uh, so I would say the hardest bird for me to work with was Rasta. And I have a series on him. He's an Alexandrian parakeet. And he was just so fearful. And because he was so fearful, it led to aggression. And it, it switched really quickly. So I'd be working through fear. And suddenly he would get either so scared or just like a, a limit would be reached and he'd go for aggression. Um, 
And he took, I mean, legitimately, I think I had him for like four months. And the cool thing is that we were living in a double wide trailer at a theme park that was going to be torn down the next year. And so it wasn't like some high class living where you had to worry about having the bird and it's, you know, in a safe enclosure. It, it kind of had free range of the house. So it didn't yeah. really matter if it chewed up cupboards because... Um, the house was going to be torn down and turned into a paintball field later. So, um, <laughs> like literally. So yeah, no, that's true. So there was some, but even with that freedom, yeah, it still took the, forever. Yeah, one of the things that Rasta was really nervous about was that like a cage door was going to be closed on him. So <laughs> I propped him open, like permanently propped them open with chairs, like heavy metal chairs, and made little areas for him to like walk from. I taught him that he could fly around, no problem, there were no dangers, no no issues, and he just had like free reign of the house. And even given that much freedom, which is not something I would normally recommend for a situation, but this situation really deemed it necessary, um, four months, and it was really long, and it was working with him every single day, multiple times a day. A lot of the time I was just hanging out, letting him understand that me walking around didn't mean I was like gonna go over and grab him and shove him in his cage. Um, so not using any sort of force and earning his trust. It took a good four months. I remember freaking out the day he stepped up and telling Dave, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like he did it, he did it because it was such a long time coming. Um, so he was the hardest. He took probably the most patience, the most time. Uh, I felt like I showed the least amount of progress for the amount of time because nobody could truly understand each milestone for being as huge as it was. Like the fact that he, I remember one day he, he just barely butted his foot against my hand and I was like, oh, that was amazing. It was a long <laughs> process, that's for sure. Yeah, and it was like nobody got it, um, but it was huge. So he was definitely the hardest, I wanna say, for me. That's uh, it? I think most people ask us like how, do you become a trainer? And I think you become a trainer from experience. I, I say this all the time with magic stuff, like hurry up and fail. You know, you don't learn until you get out there and you do it. And I don't believe that formal education is the right way for everybody. Um, I certainly didn't have it with learning birds and you certainly didn't have it with learning <laughs> birds. And, um, and we've been very successful with it. And I, I think that with that is you know a motivation and a drive and a passion that fuels that and if you're if you don't have that motivation that passion to fuel then maybe finding a less direct or a more direct route like going to shovel poop for a year first and then getting to work with the animals is maybe a better option for you but yeah, I think it really like depends on how you learn. Having a mentor, learning under somebody. If you see somebody that's doing what you want to do, just go ask them. Um, see if you can shadow them for a day. If you can help them. If you can do something in that in that respect. Because there were trainers that I met that I was just like, oh my gosh, can I just pick your brain? You know, we would watch shows, yeah. and I'd be like, can I like geek out and talk to you about animal training real quick? And and they were usually more than happy to talk yeah. about animal training because the general public is is not necessarily asking those types of questions where they want they like love that somebody can appreciate all the effort that went into training a behavior that most people are just like oh yeah that was cute um whereas we might look at it and be like that was really complicated and like complex I wonder how they trained this in which order and da 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 you know um so we can kind of appreciate it but I think if you can just bug people till they respond not us but <laughs> somebody else <laughs> <laughs> And it's time to go get ready for a show. Is that too mean? No. They're like, she does not like people. What was that? <laughs>